Insanity is hereditary. Uh, you get it from your children. Now, uh, when I think about that, you know, you got to remember, I am someone's child as well. So my mom's probably saying, amen, and, and Curse is going, wait a minute, you know, or whatever, or, you know, anybody tuning into that. But maybe you've seen that bumper sticker, maybe you've seen it on a shirt or whatever, they sell mugs, all the rest. Um, but insanity is hereditary. And I also believe it's exponential. And what I mean by that is the more kids you have, the crazier it gets, but not just additive, it gets multiplicative, right? And so we have three biological kids and at times things have gotten a little more wild each time. See, and I often say this with parents that uh, if you're a sports fan, you know what man-to-man -man coverage is, right? That's one-to-one. -one. You've got a game of three-on-three -three or five-on-five -five or whatever, and you just say, okay, we're going to take, that's your person. You're going to guard that person. And when we had two kids, we pretty much had man-to-man -man coverage, right? I mean, I'm like, okay, Len, I got Steven. You take Bethany. We got it. And then along came Carissa, and it's been zone defense ever <laughs> since. You're like, wait, wait, how did that person go? Ah, you know, they went right up and they split the defense, right? So when you think about that, again, um, take that in mind. But, but these days, here's the thing. I actually oversee a K through 12 school, right? And we have over 150 kids in that environment. And there's days where the phrase, the inmates have taken over the asylum. <laughs> uh, that seems like the mission statement to the school to me. I'm like, maybe we should get a plaque and just put it up there, you know, because it is a, a very accurate view of what has happened. And I don't know if I'm talking about the parents or the teachers or the administrators or what, but I just know it can be kind of a funny farm. And so you think about this again, insanity is hereditary. It's probably multiplicative but it's also contagious. When I think about that, it is a contagious disease, right? You get it from everybody's kids. Everybody's kids, uh, kids of all ages can make you crazy. See, there's times in my life where I'll, I'll deal with a certain kid and I'm thinking in my mind, I don't understand. And then along comes the parent conference and you're like, I, <laughs> I do understand. I'm starting to get it. I get it very well. And so when you think about this, I'm sure it's happened in our lives too, that sometimes people have said certain things about our kids and then they meet you know, one of us and they go, ah, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But you think about this, the human condition is insanity, right? And that's why I titled today's teaching, The Insanity of Humanity. And see, so you think about the, uh, you know, relative uh, different people, some humans may be a little smarter than others, maybe a little more sane than others. But one of our smartest ones, at least uh, I think so, is Albert Einstein, right? And he said this, he had a quote, and maybe you've heard this one also, but insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, right? Where you go, well, uh, as a scientist, of course, what scientists do, right, is they replicate things. They do certain thing and, they, and the result comes out of that and they, they get to understand that if I mix these two chemicals and it blows up, oh, wow, what do you know? Right? But if you keep mixing those two chemicals and you're surprised that it blows up, then there's something maybe that you're missing. Right? And so I think about that again. The insanity of humanity is that we make the same mistakes over and over and over again, and we're surprised. We're shocked. We, we don't change a variable, but we get the same constant, and we go, how is it constant chaos? And you go, well, have we learned a lesson? Do we do anything different than our great, 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 not so great grandfathers might have done, our forefathers and all the rest of that, our foremothers, if you will. And so that's the insanity, I think, sometimes, of humanity. And I think one of the craziest thought any kid has, and I, every kid has it, I think, which is, I will not be like my parents. I can remember that. I can remember thinking, well, I know what I won't do. I won't be like you. And then I go and be just like them, you know? And I say things that I find myself going, <gasps> did that come out of me? How did that come out of me? That's, that's my dad, or that's my mom's phrase. How did this happen? How am I saying this to my kid? You kids have made me crazy. I'm as crazy as my parents were, right? And then you go, 
Someday, you crazy kids, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have crazy kids. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to say something your dad used to say, and you'll go, it happened. <gasps> oh, no. Now, again, some of that's good, right? Some of that's great. In fact, there are things that I look back and I think, I don't think my parents were the crazy one. I think I was. So, again, that, that hereditary thing, the reason it's funny, of course, is it's circular, right? You go like, Wait, you get it from your kids, but who'd your kids get it from? Well, they got it from me. I, hmm. You know, and so you think about this. What does it have to do with 2 Corinthians 11? Nothing. I just thought it was a good intro. No, it has everything to do with 2 Corinthians 11. This is what it has to do. Paul considered the Corinthians his kids. They were driving him crazy. They were driving him crazy. Now, sometimes they thought he was crazy. And sometimes, frankly, Paul probably thought he was crazy. He said, maybe I'm the crazy one. But I know that this group has made me go bonkers, absolutely nuts. And you think about this. Paul was a pastor, right? And being a pastor is a lot like being a parent. I've said that to different pastors over my life, different people in ministry. And again, just because someone has the title or doesn't have the title doesn't mean they're not it. We used to say all the time, this person's a pastor. They just don't know it. Um, you know, because the truth is they just went... And, and poured into people. They cared about people. They were somebody who was always looking for how they could make hard situations easier, how they could make complex things more simple, how they could actually reach out to somebody, lift them up, and all that stuff. And I said, well, they're just being a, a parent. They're just parenting people. They're just caring for other people's kids. You know, that's all it really is. And so if you have been a parent, it's, there are certain things I say, oh, well, it's a parent. To a parent. It's obvious to a parent, right? You don't have to explain certain things to a parent. I can remember thinking to myself first that I didn't want to have kids. I was wrong about that. Um, really glad that I do have kids. But beyond that, I thought I would be a certain kind of parent, right? Kind of the arm's length parent, kind of the, you know, let them figure the stuff out on their own. I won't get over involved. And then I'm like, <sighs> I won't worry. I won't be like that, right? And then I'm like, it's three minutes late. Where are they? And stuff like that. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? Well, that's just a parent to a parent. That's going to happen. It, it drives you crazy to care so much about somebody that you can ultimately do so little about, right? No matter how much you do, you feel like you can't do enough, right? And so, again, I think about that. If you've ever had any sense of responsibility, to somebody who has a sense of irresponsibility, right? Or, and, and I'm not meaning to overcharacterize youth, but isn't youth kind of in some ways even meant to be a time of immaturity? You're like so immature as a little kid, and you're like, uh, yeah, that's how that works, you know? But, but you're making me crazy, and you're like, of course, I, they're kids, they're supposed to be crazy. But insanity can be so multiplica multiplicative that you say the more the merrier? No, the more the scarier. I mean, when you think about it, it's like the care of 150 kids. People say, oh, it's a small school. And I go, oh, man, we, we have like just a, we have to have all these scares. I don't know if you know that like a bomb scare. We have to, have, they call them drills, but you know what I'm talking about, where they go like, okay, yeah, they're planned scares, you know, but but that alarm goes off and they're like, oh, you know, and, and, and it's just everyone's got to file out the building. And every time when that happens, I look at it and say, look at all these souls. I'm like, small school. This is a lot of responsibility. This is somebody's kid. And what if this was a real active shooter situation? What if this was a real threat? What if this was not just a drill? See, you think about that, the more the merrier, yes, we have a great time. But the more the scarier. And considering the conduct of the Corinthians, you can see how Paul became a basket case pretty quickly. Paul repeatedly calls himself a madman in this chapter, a fool. All throughout, he's like, man, I, I, I'm, maybe call me crazy, but here's what I think about all this. What was making him so whacked out? Well, it was really false teachers. It was the tendency of the Corinthians, which is really the insanity of humanity. It wasn't just them. That's why God recorded this for us. To accept and follow the people who cared about them the least, they would give them the most. And the people who cared about them the most, they would give them the least. 
And I would love to think, oh, well, this doesn't happen and it won't happen to my kids and nobody that I love will make this mistake, but people make it all the time. Oh, I won't do this. I'm too smart for that. And then we're so dumb that we do the same thing. See, and I think about this, Paul was saying, man, there's people who come in and they manipulate you and they lie to you and they, they take, 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 take from you and you give, give, give to them. And then he says, and I, I come with a giving attitude and you don't want to take it. I give with some advice that would actually change your life for the better and I have no agenda other than your advancement. And guess what? You reject it. Anyone who's a parent knows exactly what this is about. But anyone who's a kid actually grows past it and realizes, yeah, I did a lot of that. Oh, man, did I listen to my peers and not listen to my parents. My peers were so smart and my parents were so dumb. And then you go, well, I don't know. In time, I've come to see it pretty differently. See, I remind you the last four chapters of 2 Corinthians directly address the pain that Paul was trying to get them to avoid by going off the wrong direction. And few things hurt the heart of a parent more than watching a kid, their own kid, heading the wrong direction. But if you have a pastor's heart as a parent, the truth is watching anyone's kid going off in the wrong direction is also hurtful. You go look out in traffic, go, well, it's not my kid. No way. You read a news story about something that happened, you go, well, better them than me. Not the, not the heart that Paul had. Paul had the pain of looking around and every kid was his kid on some level. And I think about this, making the same bad decisions over and over and over again. Humanity does, the insanity of humanity, to make the same bad decisions generation after generation and expect a different result. Well, how did it work for that generation? Horribly. Think about the Israelites for just a moment. They're, for all time, they were like that generation. They go, how can they be so stupid? And then you go... The same way we can be so stupid, right? I mean, it's a metaphor for us all throughout. It's a real life situation of theirs that God recorded so that we could recognize ourselves in the mirror of Scripture. See, it's apparent as a parent, but it's less obvious to a kid. And so I think about the insanity of humanity, of picking the wrong peers and thinking that my life will go great by surrounding myself with people whose lives are not going great and who have no commitment to that. I think of, you know, falling in love with that arrogant and abusive person, but man, there's so much fun. So they're not much fun. And see, again, as a parent, these things are so apparent. My parents said them to me. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And you go, ah, that's so dumb. And then your kids come along and you go, well, kids, show me your friends and I'll show you. Where'd you get that? Well, I guess I got it from my crazy parents. <laughs> So you think about this, you look at this chapter, I hope you'll keep in mind Paul as a pastor, but also as a parent, a parent at wit's end from watching his Corinthian kids, his crazy Corinthian kids go from one abusive relationship to another, one abusive religious relationship to another. And he knew a little something about that. So let me tell you here in verse one, here you go. Second Corinthians 11, verse one, he says, oh, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. I don't know if you've ever said this as a parent. I've said to my kids, I know you've already heard this, but just give me five minutes. I'm going to, I need to say it one more time. You, I know you put up with all kinds of idiocy from your dad. I know you're tired of hearing the lecture, but please do me one little favor, which is hear it one more time, which is, uh, When you cross the street, my kids know. I'm hoping they'll always hear it. Look both ways. Watch for cars. Watch for cars. Watch for cars. Whenever we were in things and they're like, we know, Dad, watch for cars. And I'm like, I have, my work here is done. (laughs) When when they can quote it, when they say it. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to have kids someday. And they're going to see that kid just watching their little hologram instead of watching the (laughs) flying car coming by. And they're going to go, watch for co- flying cars, you know, or whatever, and uh, watch for flying saucers. And, and this is what he's saying. He's saying, just please bear with me. I, I, I promise it's out of a heart of love. He warns us that he's going to do this. And it's an interesting thing because he says, I'm even going to be a little bit foolish in your eyes. 
And I think that's interesting because there's a, there's a funny scripture, a pair of scriptures in Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. If you write that down, it's a funny one because I've thought about it many times. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. People say the Bible contradicts, you know, that it's full of contradictions. Well, this one's an apparent contradiction two verses apart because in the Proverbs, here's what it says. It says, answer, do not answer a fool according to their folly, lest you be an idiot. And then the very next verse says, you know what? Do answer a fool according to their folly, lest they be wise in their own eyes. What is, what is it saying? You're like, well, make up your mind. You're crazy writing that stuff in the Proverbs. No, this is what you understand. You go, you know what? There's times the normal case is don't lower yourself to another person's level. If somebody is rude and arrogant, don't be rude and arrogant back. Don't, you're not going to change the way they are. But see, a parent, a parent feels differently about that. It's like, if I got to be a moron, to have more of an impact on your life, I'll do it. If I got to look crazy, I'll dress up like a complete fool if you'll remember what I said. I will tell you dumb jokes if somehow the message will come through. See, I think about this. Again, normal case, you're fooling yourself if you think that a fool is going to listen to wisdom. But you know what? I'm a fool enough as a parent to believe that over years and years and years and years, I could maybe make a difference in my kid's life the way my parents made a difference in mine. So there's a time to fight foolishness with foolishness, and that's what Paul is talking about here. He's tried every reasonable response, but he says, I'll try an unreasonable one. And so you think about this. I don't know what that is, but it'll make us all crazy. Anybody got any ideas? It sounds like an alarm going off. There we go. Okay. Whoo! I, I, I'm here talking about false alarms, but okay. Uh, um, I don't know. I'm thinking it's probably a smoke alarm, but if Lynn, if you can just check on it, because I would hate to be here talking at, while the you know place is 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 going up. So um, he goes on. Was. Yeah, it's a fire alarm, right? Smoke alarm. There is a restaurant next door, and so, you know, they're probably using the, as I have often done, you use the smoke alarm as a cook timer. You know you know your meal is ready when the alarm goes off. You're like, ah, meal's ready, you know, woo! Yeah, there you go. It said 40 minutes, and I did 50. It's cool. I like it a little more crunchy. But um, so, so you see in verse 2, we'll try to move on, see if we can do that. But he says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I've betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the first thing that I wrote down is we're crazy if, we're crazy if we think we can two-time God and still have a healthy relationship, right? Because the first thing Paul's going to talk about as a parent is he's saying, I want you to have a great relationship with Christ. But, you know, the first thing I got to do as a parent is give you a little parental advice, which is um, cheating on God is not a good idea, right? That's not going to lead to the, the kind of positive output you want. The Bible in numerous places says that God is a jealous God. Now, some people don't understand what it's talking about there, and they're kind of like, they picture God as this like insecure, you know, suspicious kind of checking your emails and stuff like that, and controlling and abusive. Not at all. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking um, about zealous. In fact, some passages even use and substitute that translation into English zealous he's a zealous god what is zeal zeal is passion it's it's love it's 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 a sense of of uh you know commitment to and god is really into us i mean i don't know how somebody's he's just like crazy about you like like as a parent i'm zealous for my kids you know i'm 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 jealous of their their lives i i want their lives to matter and for them to know that they matter and for the right people to come into their life to 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 be a blessing to them like they should and would be to others so there's an unhealthy jealousy and there's a healthy jealousy and this is the healthy one he's saying god's a, a jealous god he's a zealous god he's not a control freak he's not somebody who's like always telling, don't talk to them don't talk to them don't touch that don't do that. what he's saying is if there's something that would harm you or hurt you, man, I, I care about that. I, I want you to be as devoted to me as I am to you because I know this is going to be a positive and healthy relationship. So God isn't insecure, but he knows we are. And he knows that because we're insecure, sometimes we'll chase bad love rather than good love. 
because, well, bad love's better than no love, right? And stuff like that. And, and all those things are wrong. And as a parent, you see sometimes a kid doing that. They're like, oh, well, I don't have any friends, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick these fake friends, and that's better. And you're like, no, it's not. It's better to have your, your parents are your friends. Yeah, but you have to love me. No, I don't, but I do. I have to. I do. Remember, your compliments don't count because they're parent compliments. You're going to say it even if it's true. And you go, no, they should matter the most because I can tell you. I will also tell you the difficult things, haven't I? There's times where I've had to say things that maybe hurt you temporarily. And you say, I hate you. Okay. If you've never been hated as a parent, you probably have never been a parent. But God has a jealous, zealous, passionate love for people. And he doesn't, he knows two-timing him is not going to be, cheating on him isn't going to be a positive relationship for anybody. And so Paul had this protective perspective that a parent would. And so that's what I first of all see is that we're crazy as humanity to think that we're we're going to find something better than God's love. Oh, God's love, it's so restrictive. You know, of all the trees of the garden you can eat, except this one that brings death. And I go, well, I want that one. And you go, oh, man, how, how could I possibly think as a parent that that is the best choice? And yet, don't we do it? Why is it the insanity of humanity? Because Adam and Eve were so stupid. And you go, like I'm not? Like Scott? And Lynn haven't been pretty dumb along the way, too. Like Phyllis and Ed weren't pretty dumb along the way. Sorry, Mom and Dad. But you think about this and you go, that's the insanity of humanity. But hopefully, the input of a parent is sometimes it breaks through. Sometimes God's voice gets heard. And I love that because Paul, again, was treating them as kids. And he says, Verse 3, not because it was condescending, but instead he was condescending himself. He's getting down on the floor and being almost a fool for them, saying, guys, I fear, verse 3, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. See, I wrote this down too, that um, we're crazy if we prefer complexity to simplicity. And yet humanity loves to do this. I almost, as a rule in my life, realized that if something's simple, it's probably God. And if something's complex, it's probably me. Right? I can find a harder way to do just about everything. Uh, where they, there's got to be a harder and more difficult and painful way to do this. Um, and God's like, we could do it the easy way. And you're like, no, 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 I'll do it my way. And you go, wow, that's interesting. I don't know if any of you guys have ever noticed, but simple is up there on the wall behind me. Just simple. It's one of the words that so made me just light up when I came into this room. I'm like, simple. Imagine simple. Because I've been through so many ministry environments that were complex, super complex. And it's like each week, everyone's thinking, how can we make this more complex? And I'm like, I don't know. Each week I was thinking, can we make this any more simple? You know, and on our website, simple. On our mission statement, simple. Because this is what I know. <laughs> if it's simple, it probably is getting closer to God's solution. Because mankind loves to make things complex. In fact, we're very impressed, impressed with complexity sometimes. Like, there's somebody that I was talking with the other day, and they were super impressed with somebody who's very religiously educated. And they said, this guy's amazing. He's an incredible teacher. I have no idea what he's talking about most of the time. And I'm like, I don't know. That doesn't fit my definition, right? My definition is if Miffy can take some language, an Asian language that's near impossible to figure out for me and teach me to say, hello, my name is Scott, in another language, I go, that's a great teacher who makes it simple, who makes it accessible, who makes it something that I can get. You know, again, what's a great math teacher in my mind? Not the one who can wow me with the complexity. It's the person who can bring me into it with the simplicity, where you go, well, that's not hard. All these years I thought math was hard. And they're like, no, it's not that hard. Look, here's the formula. I think of this, you know, I mentioned Albert Einstein. Do you know he's most known for a, a E equals MC squared? You don't think that guy could have filled chalkboards full of chalk 
with crazy, you know, multiple chalkboards all the way through a whole thing. And yet his life's memory is, is a few letters. E equals MC squared, which you can actually explain to a child, which is basically energy is related to how heavy something is and how fast it's going. So you get hit by a bus that's going 60, that's going to be worse than getting hit by a skateboard that's going three miles an hour. And you're like, oh, Einstein, you were a genius. Now, again, do you think he knew some other things too? Yes. But again, what is he most remembered for? Something that opened up understanding to other people. And I love this. Paul's saying, you guys are so enamored of, so impressed by complexity. And he said, the simplicity of Christ. Ah, Christ, that's like a kid's story. Go, yeah, let the little ones come unto me because of such is the kingdom of God. Unless you receive the good news that God loves you like a parent and would do anything, including lay down his own life for you, then you won't receive eternal life because you don't have to work for it. I just love you that much. I'm just crazy about you. And that's crazy to, to go to the come cross and go through all this and not fight back. And, and why would you do this for a bunch of... Because it's a parent to a parent. What parent wouldn't readily step into any suffering for their own child? I don't, well, the good ones, even the bad ones. So you think about this, he says, there's really one true pairing. You're a spouse to Christ, but you're getting stolen away by a sneaky snake. You know, Mr. Steel, your girl's coming. And, and here he is. Imagine yourself as a parent, you know, and you're like, your son or your daughter's just engaged in this wonderfully healthy, reciprocal, godly, loving relationship. And along comes, bum, 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 the bad guy. And you're like, He's so cool. He's so cool on his motorcycle with no helmet and all this stuff. And now I'm going to be on a motorcycle with no helmet. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. I kind of like Prius guy. I like, I like that guy. That guy's really nice, you know? And you're like, he's so practical and, and all this stuff. And you're, oh, dad, bleh, he's boring like you. Like the guy who's like loved mom all these years. You're like boring. And you go... Yeah, I don't know, you know. Suddenly you see that manipulative creep come in, you know, come creeping in. And, and this is what Paul was saying as a parent, as a protective, corrective parent. He's like, don't, don't fall for the snake. The snake, not all that. And you think about the seduction of Eve. Again, what was it? It was that God was holding out on them. It's that, man, life would be so much better if you did it your way instead of God's way. And what happened? They got kicked out of the garden. They didn't have access to any of the wonderful things that they had before. And they spent the rest of their lives fighting back. And guess what? The insanity of humanity, the first murder in their own family. And you just go, who? Ah, ah. You don't think they would take that back if they could? And they, if Adam and Eve could sit with Cain and Abel and say, ah, do not do as we have done. See, when God said you will not die, or when God said you will die, and the sneaky snake said, no, you won't, it was so easy to believe the sneaky snake. That's why he's the sneaky snake. And since the temptation, again, it was away from simplicity. 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 What's the opposite of simplicity? Duplicity. Two-facedness. Forked tongue. You know, the word simple actually means single focused without a lot of multiple answers you know <laughs> kind of true false versus fill in the blank and we're crazy if we think a complex life is more impressive than a simple life you know again sometimes we we go wow look at that but you know what um, apple i think of adam and eve and it wasn't an apple but you know the apple and apples uh Devices. I have many of them here. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm not always an Apple fan, but I but I can tell you they're simpler than some other things. And sometimes people even put them down for that. Oh, that's computers for babies and computers with training wheels. And I'm like, put the training wheels on it. You know, I don't. I, don't, I, I know both PCs in this, but there's times where I'm like, thank you for simplicity. This was something Steve Jobs was big on. He's he would ruthlessly and truly ruthlessly hound their engineers make it more simple bring it back more simple 
take some features away, bring, bring it down to one button, bring it down to no button, bring it down to something that even a child can use, bring it down to something that even a grandparent can use, use it that way. And other people are like, add features, man, make it complex. And they stripped it down. Guess what? They're the biggest, most profitable company in American history. And you think about it, it's the beauty of simplicity. See, you think about this. My call into ministry, John 21. And you know what it was? It, it, I've shared it with you before, but it was, do you love me? Jesus saying to Peter, but also saying it to me by extension, do you love me? Then feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He even says, my little lambs, like, like little, little lambs. It, it, he didn't say, feed my giraffes, you know, or feed my dolphin. They're super smart. He, feed my sheep. And you know what's dumber than sheep? Lambs. The only thing dumber than sheep are little sheep. <laughs> and you think about this, what does that mean? Well, over my lifetime, I think actually my endeavor has been to make my teachings more simple, not more complex. Sometimes pastors, people have a pressure to be profound. Whoa, wow, I'm with some deep, esoteric, bizarre thing that nobody's ever seen before in the scriptures. And you go, like, did you know that the seventh seal of the seventh seal of the 14th horse of the seventh apocalypse is actually this guy over in some country? And everyone's like, oh, this guy's so amazing. I don't understand most of what he says. And I go, that's not a compliment to me. Again, my compliment that I love is when people say, my kids love your teachings. I actually get asked back to children's chapel all the time over at the school. And to me, that's the ultimate, ultimate compliment right? Jesus was a man who was simply profound, and he was profoundly simple, and kids had a way of flocking to him, and who were the people who hated Jesus the most? The learned. The learned, because they became the burned, because he would always burn them with simplicity. They would make it really complex, and he'd go, boom, and it messed up their whole world, where everyone was dependent on them, to understand stuff. Oh, you, you're not mature enough to understand the scriptures as we are. And you're like, really? I think the scriptures, if you can't be put in a room, read the scriptures and come to a conclusion, it's probably the wrong conclusion, right? If you need somebody's book about the book about the book of the Bible to explain it to you, probably their explanation is complex and manly, man-made, not simple and godly. And so when you think about this, verse 4, he says, if he comes and preaches another Jesus who we haven't preached, or if you receive a different spirit you haven't received, or a different gospel which you haven't accepted, you may well put up with it. He's basically saying, you guys, ah, drives me crazy how much garbage mentally and spiritually you guys will eat and go, junk food, junk food. <laughs> You know, and then you go, here's a healthy diet. Oh, yeah. And I remember as a kid, this has been one of the greatest joys of my life. It, I'm sure it was one, my mom's greatest joy. I used to be a chocolate milk and uh, mac and cheese Italian. Okay, those were, the, uh, uh, those were the two things I would eat. Uh, I would drink chocolate milk and I would eat mac and cheese. And if it was green or it was vegetable or had any, any nutrition component, I was I was opposed to it on conscientious means, you know, objection. And so um, that was it. That was my diet. And then over time, I, I actually got to where I'm, I'm like, hey, mom, you know, collard greens are good. You know, these are these are amazing Brussels sprouts, you know, and stuff. Okra still nasty. But, you know, there's stuff that I'm like, yeah. And seeing our son do that has been so funny to me. You don't understand how much he was like this. And last I see him, he's like, oh, um, you know, the. He was eating more healthily than I do. And I was like, the insanity of humanity. But sometimes we learn. Sometimes we learn. See, and Paul's saying here, the junk food, man, learn that the junk food is it, it's, it's not actually helping you. And Paul's describing a pattern that, again, has shocked me in my life. But it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Why should it surprise me? Why should it? But it still does. People's love for people who don't love them. People's love for people who use and abuse them, they're almost like magnetically drawn to it. It's, it's like a weird pattern in people, but the nice guy finishes last. 
I mean, it, it's true. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, every, watch every show. Watch every movie. Watch every sitcom. Whatever it is. It's like the nice guy, least popular. Most popular, the kid who, you know, shoves people aside, ignores the girls, and they're all like, ah. You know, and stuff, and you go, what is it? It's the insanity of humanity. And why are we drawn to those who care so little about us and sometimes repelled by the very person who cares the most? Back in high school, this was definitely true. And I think about it again. I'm in high school now, right? This is the funny thing. I'm in high school now as an adult. And I go, no, 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 not him. Him. You know, I'm like watching girls. And I'm like, oh, no. Why do they all like that guy? That guy is such a bum. And then you're like, but they do. And they, they fight over him. And they're all, ah. And meanwhile, they, they go talk to Mr. Nice Guy about Mr. Not Nice Guy. And you're like, how can this be? There's songs written about this, everything about it. Why is it? Because we're dumb. Okay, so Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Think about this. He talks about a different gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. People love bad news. Did you know that? They love beatings. I don't know what it is. Thank you, Pastor hit me again. Like, you know, it's like, I, I don't mean to make light of abuse, but I'm telling you, I know people who seem to have a cathartic effect by being told how mad God is at them, how bad they've been, how horrible they are, and, you know, all this stuff. And they're like, man, I, I read the scripture and it's good news. God's mad, madly in love with me, <laughs> crazy about me in spite of my shortcomings and they pervert the gospel of christ isn't it funny that the perversion is a perversion that sometimes is laying a heavier weight on people see i think sometimes people think that the biggest problem in the spiritual world are false beliefs like you know really crazy cults you know that we worship at the great zucchini or something like that and you're like i don't know that 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 one's never really drawn a lot of people that i know into other than in Boulder, Colorado, maybe, <laughs> where I grew up. But, um, but beyond that, some of the biggest perversions, as he called it, of the gospel are, are very, very prim and proper. This was the whole thing that was coming into Corinth was while they did need to bring changes, you know what happened? They swung the other way and they had people who weren't telling them, just live your sinful life. What they were telling them is, you got to go back to the law. The law is going to do it. And they would come in with a heavy hand, heavy-handed teachers, legalists. And Paul knew everything about this because he was from that background. you got to remember, when he was cutting down the legalists, who was he? Former legalist. He was a guy who knew everything about what it was to be a guy who thought the Ten Commandments were the answer to getting it right. The Ten Steps just get everything right. And so Paul brought in a good news that you want a, a cure for the insanity of humanity. It's not working your way up to God. It's accepting that God worked his way down to you. And they would leverage the legitimacy of Jesus in the Bible, and they would take two parts truth and one part lie, and they would mix it up. Did you know that the closer a counterfeit is to the real thing, the more powerful it is? And so this is one of the reasons I have, in a way, devoted my life as much as I can to trying to rightly divide the Bible with as little agenda as I can possibly give someone with as simplicity, an approach, simple an approach as I can bring, because I think the truth sets people free. But one of the things that keeps people under the most bondage is mostly truth minus the good news. Man, the good news is... God loves me like I love my kids only a thousand times more. And I go, my kids, man, sometimes I'm just plain crazy. People would say, like, why would you do that? Because I'm crazy. I'm crazy for them. I'm crazy about them. Well, I think you're biased. Absolutely I am. I am tremendously biased. I think my kids are the greatest. But guess what? I think most kids are the greatest. And I have genuinely tried uh, that even when I'll say about a kid, that kid's a bum, and then they come to me and they have a question, and I'll treat them like they were my own kid. They know it. I, there, some of them are lovable bums, too, where I'm like, oh, yeah. you know. And so I think about this. The, 
the many different ways that someone can mess up the gospel, but people love it. They flock to it. They flock to a complex, rule-laden situation rather than just a simple reality that God loves you. And, and if he's trying to get you away from something, it's because, hey, he's got really, really good advice. There's no better Jesus than the real Jesus. <laughs> There's no better Jesus than the simple Jesus. The only real Jesus is the biblical Jesus, right? <laughs> the, the, the simple thing that can be explained to a child. Not, not the, you know, 42-part commentary Jesus that you go, I, I don't know where that is in the Bible. See, now think about this. He, he died. He rose again. Okay. So, so you think about that and you go, that's, that's, that, there's a childlikeness to believing that. Yes, I believe that. But you know what? This is Paul, a very learned man, and he was a guy of <laughs> tremendous intellectual capacity. And he would say, you know what? I am making it my aim not to wow you with my intellect, but to just connect you with the love, the crazy, crazy, crazy love that God has for you. To give you the hope of forgiveness, but the hope of eternal life. And to go before you and go through the worst of the worst of the worst of the insanity of humanity. And come out saying, I beat it. <laughs> I beat it. And if you'll follow me, you'll beat it too. See, you look at this. I consider I'm not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Verse 5. Even though I'm untrained in speech, yet I'm not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Paul's greatest strength was his writing. And, and, you know, some people are great writers and not as great as speakers. Some people are great speakers. Maybe they don't write their own speeches. But you look at this and you see in that society, especially, oration was very important. And you think about it as a parent. Think about being graded for the quality of your oratory skills as you're trying to explain your love to a child. Would that be a tiny bit frustrating? Mom, you use your grammar wrong. Ah, you know, you go, that, that would drive you crazy, right? And this is what Paul's saying. They're, they're critiquing him. We talked about that last week. While he's saying, I, this isn't a speech. This isn't a, a, a presentation. This is, this is my love for you being expressed. And so Paul, what he was saying and how he was saying and why he was saying it was so much more important than the careful world cho word choice. But people came in with silver tongues and snaky hearts and drew them aside. Isn't that sad? They, because they said it a little more clever than Paul did. They're like, I like this guy. He talks about the imminent apostles, the super apostles. He's actually using some sarcasm all throughout this book, uh, this chapter, as you'll see. These guys are taking us to the deeper things. They are the, you know, learned ones. They're the experts. And we know from extra biblical writings what they were like there in Corinth. Again, they, whew, they had some incredible arguments. So you go, that's the only problem with this is not true. Um, you know, it's a special revelation. You're part of the inner club. And they even have these to these day, uh, this day, different clubs. They're secret societies where you only learn after level 10 and level 11. And that exclusivity, did you know one of the things you can do to make people want to be part of your club is tell them they can't be part of your club? You want to get somebody to think that you're really special? Be exclusionary. See, and the problem with the gospel is it's really inclusionary. It's like... God so loved the world. And you go, no, no, it doesn't mean world. It means our world. It means the little world that I agree with. That's the world that he loved. You know, but, it, but you'd understand that if you had gone through our 15-week course on what the word word world, word world means. And you're like, what? I don't get it. Well, that's because you're not quite as smart as everyone else. And so here's Paul saying, look, man. <laughs> Maybe I didn't impress you with that, but could my love for you impress? Could God's love for you impress? Is that enough? And I like this because I think about um, an illustration I heard once. about It was a, a reading for a, someone who was going to star in a, a, a movie that was a Christian movie, and they got sort of a known and unknown actor was applying for it. It's a real story. And so they had him um, you know, do the audition. And there was a classically trained, amazing uh, Shakespearean actor, somebody who had, you know, a big name. 
And they, that person read from Psalm 23. That was what the reading was. They were supposed to read Psalm 23, you know. And they had all the gestures right. They had all the into, intonation correct and the diction, and they pronounced all the words correctly and stuff. And at the end, everyone was like, wow, that was amazing. And everyone's like, this, this person should get that. And then the next person was just like a country preacher nobody had ever heard of, right? And he stood up and recited the Psalm 23 from memory, stumbled over a couple words. But by the end, everyone in the room was crying. And the Shakespearean actor says, I know the psalm. He knows the author. And I was like, they gave the job to the country preacher because they're like, that's, a, that's it. You know, that, that's an amazing thought there. And, and, and you think about it, Paul, Paul's boasts are kind of backward boasts. He, they're the inverse of the false folks. The false folks were always boasting about how great they were. And Paul's saying, no, I, I'm showing you how not great I am, but how great God is. I'm, I'm boasting of God. Do you understand? I'm trying to do that. And, and it's crazy that people will put up with people's polished speech and fall for it. The insanity of humanity is, I think, have we not seen this before? Couldn't we go back in history and see how sometimes people can talk big and walk small and mess things up? It, that when people start bragging about themselves, we should not listen, but people love people who self-promote. And you say, man, this is very scary. Verse 7, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted? When I preach the gospel of God to you for, for free, I mean free of charge? Again, you want to make people in our society value something, you actually raise the price. This is so weird. The psychology of this is fascinating to me. The insanity of humanity. I, I know personally a guy who had a restaurant, and their, their restaurant was doing okay, but they brought in a consultant, and the consultant looked down the menu and said, double your prices. Double your prices. And they're like, how's that good advice? We're already not having it. They doubled their prices, and people started flocking to the restaurant. Why? It must be good. It's expensive. Um, you think about this. Paul's saying, <laughs> I, I, what's your speaking fee, Paul? I'll come for free. Oh, this guy must not be any good. Um, what's your speaking fee, so-and-so? I charge a minimum of 100000 I will need this room. I travel with an entourage. Wow, this guy's good. This guy's amazing. He's worth listening to. And Paul was actually diminished in their eyes because he diminished himself. Because he said, I'll, I'll work for money. I'm not asking for anybody's money. The Corinthians thought it was well below the dignity of a super apostle to be a tent maker. Remember, he's a tent maker. That's what Paul was. He, he, that's what he did. He was a manual laborer. He, he was among slaves. Many slaves worked in the tent making thing. And so he was a guy among the people, same way Jesus was. One of the complaints about Jesus the whole time he was here is he wasn't impressive enough. He, he, he didn't go to the great schools. He's just a carpenter kid. He's from Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? You think about this. The false teachers are always pumping their pedigree. Well, I went to this school. I did this. I have these letters. I have these recommendations. Jesus is like, what's your recommendation? Um, I guess my history of serving and loving people. And the entire psychology of this makes me crazy. I don't know if it's ever made you crazy. It makes me crazy to think that we live in a society so inverted on things. I get catalogs in the mail. I don't know if you get these. I don't know how to stop them. You can't write to them and tell them to stop. But they're like multiple catalogs of the same catalog. And you know what they do? They put a price tag on the catalog. I have catalogs where it seriously says like nine ninety five up in the corner. And I'm like, you sent me four of these at no charge. Why do you put that there? The marketers know why they put it there, because they want you to value it by putting a price tag on it. Right? But they're not selling it. Nobody's buying this stupid catalog to buy more of your stuff, right? So I think to myself, I see through marketing. Does anyone else? Apparently, it works. So there's times where I'm sitting in meetings and I'm thinking to myself, I would, I would so run from that message. And people are like, here's the message we should bring in. It works. It works. And I'm like, but that doesn't make it right. Again, over my lifetime, I have seen some people who have incredible, incredible speaking fees. I, things that just shocking to me. But the thing that's more shocking to me is that people gladly pay it. And then I've seen people who drove themselves, paid for everything themselves, 
did it for and didn't get so much as a thank you. And you go, huh. And so the false teachers were having people flock to them. And I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. And Paul says, I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. Now, he's using figurative speech here. He's not saying he actually, you know, jacked them. Um, you've heard the saying, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, he's saying, I robbed Peter's church over there um, to pay Paul's church over here. I mean, he was saying, I, I'm actually, there's people who are very generous of heart. And uh, he says, because... The Corinthians already got jacked for everything they have from these false folks who they're like, well, no, we don't have any money left after we paid for their hotel and, 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 you know, private jet. And he's like, man, you guys need ministry. Uh, I'll take from here so I can give there. And, that, and you think about it. It's incredible because as a parent, there, there are times when you might look at a younger person and think, oh, the naivety. Oh man, if I could, if I could, if I could teach you not to get jacked, right? Not just not to get ripped off. Um, but if someone is getting something for nothing, then guess what? Somebody's getting nothing for something, right? If, if someone's getting nothing for something, someone's getting something for nothing. It goes both ways, and you're kind of like, so there's people who are the man, you know, where does this come from? Who's paying for this? Well, somebody's paying for it. And verse 9, he says, When I was present with you and in need, I wasn't a burden to anyone. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I don't love you? God knows I love you. You can hear Paul having a mental argument with himself and with these folks, right? I mean, you get it, what he's saying there. He's going, you know what? As a parent, every once in a while, you'll get fed up and you start doing something really childish. You know you're childish at the time. You're like, oh, okay, everyone's going to brag? Well, well, I, I'm going to brag. And nobody's going to stop me, all right? And you're like, mom, don't. Or dad, no, dad, no, don't do it. And you go, no, 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 no. Nope, I'm going to be just as big a baby as everyone else. If this is the way we're going to talk, do you, no, 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 I'll, I'm, I'll do it. And you see Paul here, he didn't support, or he didn't accept support from local churches when he ministered. But this is so crazy. He, he Talk about a guy who's danged if he did and danged if he didn't. He couldn't win. Because some people were accusing Paul now of refusing to accept support because he didn't love the Corinthians. If you know anything about the uh, Far Eastern or Middle Eastern culture, you know, the, the culture of this time and still to this day, giving is an honor. The, the person with the greatest um, capacity gives to the one with the less, lesser. So it's an honor. Like, like to pay for a meal is an honor. And even if you are a, a, a person without many means, for you to pay for somebody, hospitality and all that, it was a big thing. So, so Paul's like saying, no, 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 no. I, I'll, I'll pick up the check. There were actually people who got offended by that. And they're like, if he was a real apostle, if he was really godly, he would accept your money like we do. He would be, you know making you put him up in nice hotels like we do and you go man isn't it crazy the insanity of humanity but verse 12 he says what i do i will continue to do that i may cut off the opportunity for those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast what's he saying that sentence is funny because he's basically saying you know what i could accept their support but he said but I guarantee you they won't follow me in my example. If he said, you know what, why don't you ask them, hey, do you mind next time just finding your own hotel and paying for it? No. You know, you think about this, all of a sudden you'll find out the motive because he said, I, I, I'm going to continue doing this one because I can defend this better than I can defend that. And he says, and it clearly is what he's doing. He says, I'm going to keep ministering for free that the contrast between the true and the false might be really obvious. I'm not in this for what I can get. I'm in it for what I can give. And as long as you stay paying, they'll stay. But if you fail to pay, they'll leave. I, he says, you want to find out who's false? Stop the gravy train. 
make them work like everyone else. Put them, put them in the same room. Make them have a roommate. And you'll go, oh, well, the big anointed speaker is suddenly an annoying little diva. And you think about this again, Paul's saying it. I'm not saying it. I'm just saying, amen, Paul, I've seen it. We used to have an outreach to the Miami Speedway. Uh, it was a, you know, NASCAR. We lived about a mile and a half away from it um, in Homestead. And it was always very hard for me to get ministers to get involved. We would do it, you know, and we'd hand out water and, and just, you know, basically minor first aid and all that kind of stuff because it was a complete RV lot. They, they would turn it into just this RV uh, sea of RVs, uh, recreational vehicles and stuff. And people came there and uh, oftentimes, you know, weren't, were pretty crazy kids, frankly, a lot of them. And so we would go to different churches and we would say, hey, this is an amazing opportunity to minister to people, to bring the gospel. We would do a church service out there, out in the dirt and out in the dust. Well, here's what it required. Uh, you had to be good at choking on dust. Um, you had to be good at helping people who didn't say thank you. You had to be really good at all of the things the scripture suggests are what real ministry is about, right? You had to be able to overlook offenses and not be easily offended, but actually just extend yourself as Jesus did and does. But we would try to get people involved with that, and they'd, they'd always ask us, the same question, which is, how does this translate into our ability to have our church grow? I mean, seriously, they would basically ask some variant of, but aren't these visitors and like none of them ever come to your church, right? And they would veil it, I think, under, well, you don't get an opportunity to disciple them and to really have a long-term impact on them and stuff. And I'm like, I get it. I appreciate that. We do that as well. You do that as well. But this is a tremendous opportunity to do exactly what Jesus said when he said, if you have a party, invite those who can't pay you back. Invite those who don't offer something in return. And so when I think about that again, we got to do it. It was a great and beautiful thing over the years. So many stories of God's faithfulness, but we did it mostly alone. And I don't mean we like you and me and Lynn. I'm, I mean, the, the group of people that we were with, we just could never get people to connect with this. And I'm not saying they were false teachers, but that's a big part of what Paul's saying here is like, what about if it doesn't accrue benefit directly to them? Will they get involved? That's one of the ways you can use as a filter. We're crazy if we think that, uh, that ministry is always about direct return to us for anything we do. It wasn't for Jesus. In verse 13, he says, Those are false apostles. They're deceitful workers. They're transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Stepping on the gas here, what I think about it is some of Satan's ministers are obviously sinister, right? I mean, that's just obvious. You go, well, that's... But what he's saying is some of them aren't so obvious. Some of it is a little bit more, you know, light looking. And I think about this, you know, thinking about the light company, Duke Energy. Uh, nothing against Duke Energy. I really appreciate them, but they're our local uh, provider of electricity. And... Just this week at the school, uh, I, somebody not from Duke Energy tried to scam our school. And it's actually a scam that's going around. And in fact, it's super sophisticated. It was extremely well done. Almost fell for it, but the spidey sense went off. Thank you, Lord. Uh, but, but it was all about uh, a crew about to come out to our school because uh, we, there'd been a mess up in our billing. And once the computer says disconnect, it's going to disconnect. But the only way to fix it is cash and all this stuff. And, but you know what actually triggered me? This is what's so funny. What was, they were very good, very, very good, but they were too nice. <laughs> and that's how I knew. Y'all don't work for the, 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 company, the, the company would have just cut us. They would have done all this. Um, your customer service is too good. Um, and that's nothing against Duke Energy. It's just the world we live in, right? I mean, it's so crazy. I'm like, why is this guy helping me so much? Because he's scamming me. Uh, you know, and so you think about this, verse 15. He says, it's no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. What's he saying? You can fool people, but you won't fool God. And the end doesn't justify the means. And you will find that they'll get what they 
deserve in the end. Verse 16, I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least let me receive, uh, just receive me as a fool. Don't think I'm an idiot, but if you do, at least let me boast a little further. He says, what I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishness in this confidence of boasting. What he's saying here is, he wasn't saying he was being ungodly in doing it. He's saying it's pretty inconsistent with Jesus. He didn't hear Jesus go around boasting. But he said, God is calling me to this boast so you can see it here. He's laying it out so you can understand. He says, it may seem uncharacteristic, but just think of it in the context in which it was given. He says, I'm being a fool here. This is what a boaster will do. I'm going to boast. Verse 18, he says, seeing that many boast according to the flesh, well, I'll boast too. You put up with fools gladly? You're so smart. <laughs> Again, you see that sarcasm in verse 19. He says, you, you like to listen to boasters? Well, here, you go, here I go. He says, verse 20, if you put up with it, if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you in the face, he's like, you sure put up with people treating you poorly. And he's about to... Talk about how poorly he's been treated. See, I think about this in high school. My family knows I dated a young lady who broke things off with me because I was, quote, too nice to her. She, that was it. She literally told me, you're too nice to me. And looking back, I was. I, was, I, was, I wasn't too nice. I was just nice. I was, my parents taught me to treat people a certain way. I tried to do that. But she said it made her feel guilty all the time. Guilty. I'm, and, and again, I'm not making light of mental uh, challenges uh, or, or illness or, or just, you know, the, the complexity of our psyche. I mean, it's tough, you know. But she, she came from a background in which she had been so mistreated by some people that she thought that's what she deserved. And so every time someone was nice to her, she actually felt bad because she's like, I'm not a good enough person for this kind of treatment. It was very messed up. And I consider her a friend yet to this day. We've had some contact, but she went on to be in and out of a bunch of abusive relationships after that and basically chose what she believed she deserved because of the way she'd been treated as a child. And I'm like, the insanity of humanity. Thankfully, she's come to Christ, and many things have gone so much better for her through that. But Paul's going to go kind of crazy here for a minute, boasting about all the bad stuff that's happened to him. And so think about this. He says, to our, to our shame, I say we were too weak for that. But in whatever someone's bold, I speak foolishly, I'm bold also. You can tell that Paul almost doesn't want to do it, right? You see how the buildup, he's like, okay, I, I'm going to be stupid here, okay? Get ready. I, I, but understand, I'm speaking as a fool to fools. He says, are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Verse 22, are they Israelites? Well, so am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? Well, guess what? I am too. He's like, check my resume out. You, I don't lead with it, but you want to see it? I'll bring my paperwork out. I'm a purebred. The legalists were all about that. And he said, you've never seen my diploma, but you want to see my diploma? I'll show you my diploma. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I'm speaking like a madman. Verse 23. He's like, I can't believe God's making me do this. All right. Are they ministers of Christ? I'm more. I'm more of a minister than they'll ever be. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. I lost count of how many times I've been beaten. He said, I've been to prison more frequently than all of them. I, I've been in deaths. I mean, he's like, I've been beat to death and dragged back into the city often. Not once, often. <laughs> from the Jews five times. He was a Jew, so he can say this. He says, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Five times he went to the whipping post. And people would die from one of those beatings. These were not a little spanking spoon. Paul's like a parent who's tired of hearing about the false love of these. Oh, they love me so much. They actually traveled two weeks to come here. And he said, I, I got shipwrecked to come there. That's why I didn't come. You guys are like, they're saying, Paul says he'll come and he doesn't come. He says, I was in prison being beaten. <laughs> are you kidding me? That's why I didn't. Why you don't love me. I stayed up all night, every night. <laughs> they bought me a gift. And he says, you know what, we're crazy. We're crazy if we prefer the artificial to the sacrificial. That's the last thing I wrote down there. It should be a parent to a parent. Being a parent is sacrificial, right? It's what we sign up for. If you don't want to be sacrificial, don't be a parent. But every once in a while as a parent, you get to that point where you go, 
I don't go around bragging about everything I do, but I'm about to I'm about to do it. <laughs> I'm about to tell you the, the real story. You don't even see it. He says, verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned with rocks. <gasps> three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. That's a guy who is floating out on a board without the board, right? <laughs> Hanging on a piece of wood overnight in the dark sea. And you know what's funny? I don't know if you know this, but chronologically, 2 Corinthians was written before the events of Acts 20 through 28, where so much of the stuff happened yet again. So it gets even worse. It got crazier in Paul's life. This was like, this is my rookie year. Um, you know, and this is what he says, in journeys often, I'll just, again, breeze through it, but think on these things. He said, man, I've traveled a ton in perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the Gentile, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among the false brethren, brethren in weariness, toil, sleeplessness, often hunger and thirst, fastings, cold and nakedness. He says, this is the killer. You have to star this verse. Besides the other things, verse 28, what comes upon me daily my deep concern for all the churches. What's he saying? Man, it's not even all the stuff that happened to me. It's all the stuff that happened to you. As, uh, as a parent, I could take it. It's the weight was watching my kids suffer. That was worse. That was worse. Of all, beside all the rest of this, and the shipwreck, he wasn't thinking, oh, man, what about me? He was thinking, oh, man, what about them? This is going to break the heart of many people. The greatest weight was not the things that happened to him. It was the things that happened to the people he cared about. And I think about this again, the weight of caring, the weight of caring, the weight of caring. I hope you're familiar with it. Your care for your kids can eclipse even personal physical suffering. It can make you absolutely crazy. All the churches, all the people, all the people's peoples and their kids and all the rest. And it was just one of many. And Paul knew what every parent knows. You can't care. You can't not care. You can't carry them, but you can't not carry them. You can't care too much, but you can't care too much. No matter what you do. <laughs> Who's weak, he says, and I'm not weak. Who's made to stumble? I don't burn with indignation. If I must boast, I'll boast in the things which concern my infirmity, my weakness. Paul kind of pulled a fast one on him here because he says, brace yourself. I'm going to start boasting. I'm going to boast. I'm going to brag. You ready? I'm going to really start. I'm going to tell you how great my suffering has been and how great my love for you is. And then check this out. This is where it all ends and I'll end it here, I promise. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed forever knows I'm not lying. Verse 31, in Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king was guarding the city of Damascenus with a garrison desiring to arrest me. Verse 33, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Why do you think he separated this one out and saved it for last? I, I, I wonder things like that. I either think, Paul's crazy. This almost seems anticlimactic. He's kind of like, oh, did all these crazy things happen? And not only that, but I got let down through a window in a basket. You're like, <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? How scrambled is his egg? Insanity is hereditary. No, this is, what, uh, this is what I'm telling you. I really believe this is the point. This was the first indignity that Paul had. This was the first moment maybe that he realized following Christ is going to be different than following not Christ. See, remember, he'd been a very cool guy in Judaism, right? He was a guy who was in demand. He was a guy who studied under the greatest teacher in Israel, he was a guy who they said of him, you couldn't feed him books fast enough. He was so amazing. He was used to being the guy who was with the little chocolate on the pillow. And everyone's like, that was great, Paul. Are you be here all week? And he gives a, a talk and he has to go out the window in a basket like a bunch of dirty laundry and barely makes an escape. He doesn't even get to stand up and be the man. He wasn't going to be a VIP anymore. His VIP status just went out the window when he signed up to be a basket case for Christ. See, I think about this arrogant legalist, Paul. He went to Damascus as the big man on campus, letters of human power. You can take people to prison for what they believe. And who did he leave Damascus with? A guy who could have been taken to prison for what he believed. 
Do you see the switcheroo that happened to this guy's life? Well, here's the question. We'd be crazy to think that our experience will be any less crazy than Christ's or any less crazy than the people who followed him, like Paul, and you fill in the blank. That's why I write it down. We would be crazy to think our experience will differ from Christ. And right up the bat, I think Paul, of all the other things that happened to him, this first thing really set a trend in his life where he went, hmm, God's crazy about his kids, man. He'd be crazy to call me one of his kids. I used to be trying to kill all his kids. Now he's adopted me in, but he said, welcome to the crazy functional family of faith that's going to operate within the crazy dysfunctional family of humanity, the insanity of humanity, the false teachers. Well, they may get treated really well. But Paul said the truth often gets lowered out the window in a basket. So Lord, we thank you that you can give us things that we can take with us. I pray that every one of us would. We'll go back to the insanity of humanity as we leave this place. There'll be things that we go, man, I, if only I could get somebody to see my love for them or the simplicity of this answer or, or those things. And, and we will care for and carry things that we don't even know really what to do with them. But I pray that we would really, uh, through all that, realize that you are crazy in love with us and you're crazy in love with the bunch of crazies that are all around us and i pray that we would see this form of truth in jesus name amen